Australia's looming default cliff. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Grab your stein of coffee and let's have a look at this article written by Alan Kohler in the Australian Business Review discussing the looming default cliff as he calls it. Now we've had previous articles and evidence that we've looked at where just, well, most startling was the lack of business closures. Now one website you can go to, and I will just bring it up here because I should have been planned, ASIC Insolvency Notices. Okay, you can type it into Google and you can see all of the insolvency notices of businesses. We can do a search and, well, it usually... Oh, okay, it's very fast today. Fantastic. One time I look at it live and it goes in an instant. But you can see all of the businesses that have gone under. Now there's a certain number of businesses that go under and, well, at the moment, not surprisingly, it's about half. There were some people concerned. There were predictions from insolvency practitioners, accountants, and their professional bodies that there wouldn't be enough professionals to deal with the number of insolvencies that would occur with the impact on the economy. But, well, that hasn't materialized. 50% less, less, roughly, number of insolvencies. So let's have a look at this. Let's have a look at Alan's take and what he's going to share with us. So, the key thing now, apart from getting Victoria back on its feet, is to ensure the pandemic doesn't turn into a financial crisis. Well, do you think that's even possible? Do you think it's even possible? Uh, this will be interesting to see how. how I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. This should be cons uh, consuming every waking moment of the national leadership. It should not be all-consuming, but bipartisan. Usually, recessions start with a credit squeeze and then turn into a decline in activity and employment as businesses respond to higher interest rates and falling demand by cutting production and staffing, and in many cases, by going broke. He's right there. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That clears space. It allows new businesses to get created. It, it, well, it allows people to buy up the assets from failed businesses and do a better job with less competition. It may put a dent in some of the big companies that are so big, they just stamp out any chance for someone to come up. That's the creative destruction that's needed in a free market economy, in a capitalist economy. I know people don't like challenge or adversity, but that's a part of life. It's a part of nature. And as much as we tend to pretend we're not, we're beholden to nature still. This one has worked out the other way around. The reduction in demand and production was government imposed and came first. Loan defaults and bankruptcies were wisely postponed by loan repayment deferrals, income support and temporary suspension of the pro prohibition on trading while insolvent. I am not a fan of that, but I understand why they did it, but it scares me. That, that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm not taking advantage of the, the home builder grant to do our renovations. I, I want to make sure that enough time has passed so all the dodgy characters have been weeded out even if the builder you go with if he's fine that's that could be all good but what about if his subby goes under or another subby or halfway through a job i guess maybe i'm just too paranoid everyone as an architect all of these things have an arbitrary end point starting next month as things stand the temporary lift of the ban on trading while insolvent is due to end on september 27 and loan repayment deferrals were due to end at the same time but have been extended up to a point. Last month's statement on the matter from the Australian Banking Association said customers who can restart paying their loans will be required to do so. But those with reduced incomes and ongoing financial difficulties due to the pandemic will be contacted as they approach the end of their deferral period to ensure that whatever possible they can, wherever possible they can return to payments through a restructured or variation to their loan. See, I, I suspect the bank's going to start rolling out other mechanisms to keep people going. We'll restructure your loan, but you have to sell. You need to get out. That's what I think will happen. You start seeing, you'll hear stories about people getting a tap on the shoulder. Maybe they'll let people go interest only for a period just to keep them to, to keep them in there a bit longer. Well, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Maybe the banks will just you know pay off half the loan for people. Why not? Hey, it's clown world. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. How the banks decide who to contact 
and how they'll decide whether repayments can start isn't clear. If an impecunious customer gets the nod, it's an extra four months, but it will, it will be provided to those who genuinely need some extra time. So perhaps we've seen articles where professionals have taken the advantage of these loan holidays, these extensions. Maybe they're just building up a cash reserve to have an emergency fund. It could be. It could be. So even assuming the banks do contact all the right people and then err on the side of leniency, reminder notices will start going out in February and loans will be 90 days past due in May. And this is what I've been saying, that we're going to start seeing the ramifications of this night next year. I was thinking March, but May is 90 days. And this is you know, arrears rates, guys. We can see here, this is all data. But you can see just how many people are 90 days due and then 150 days due. Look at WA and NT. This is 19, uh, 2019. They seem to have stopped publishing detailed information about how many people are deferring repayments and how big their loans are, beyond saying it's more than 800,000. The average mortgage is about 467,000, which suggests suggest 373 billion worth of loans are on suspension. That's just crazy. Job seeker. Uh, the Job Seeker Coronavirus Supplement goes to 1.6 million people and will be cut from 550 per fortnight to 250 on September 24 and then to zero on December 31. That is, unemployed people on the dole are set to go back to living on $40 a day from January 1. On September 28, the Job Keeper payment will be cut from $1,500 per fortnight to $1,200 and cut again to $1,000 on January 4 and then to zero on March 28. Figures from the Treasury show that 728,640 organizations have enrolled for the JobKeeper scheme, covering around 4.7 million employees, or 35% of the workforce. Now, what's interesting is we don't see how many, how many of those businesses that are receiving JobKeeper now don't actually need it because of the mechanism of how they rolled it out. Meanwhile, the temporary amendment to the Corporations Act, allowing directors to trade while insolvent and in ignoring letters of demands, ends the day, the day before the first JobKeeper cut. There has been no word from the government about extending it. This is the one that really, this is the one that really worries me the most. Worries me the most because I've issued letters of demand. I've gone through processes of you know clients who've do stiffed me on money. Anyone in the construction game knows how hard it is to get paid sometimes. It's different. If you're an employee, you probably may not have experienced it, you know, getting paid every week. But if you're a small business owner and it takes, you know, 90 days, 120 days to get paid and you're scraping by, you know, you could have you know, a couple hundred thousand of, of revenue about to come in, but you're living like a pauper because the money isn't there. You still got to pay your staff. You still got to pay your costs. And that, that's the cash flow. That's the big issue. That's probably the one thing that's that's improved my stress the most is just scaling back the costs of my business so I don't need to worry about getting paid on time. That that really has been the biggest thing. I'll do less work, but have less stress, much less stress, although I still seem to be going gray, and I suspect that's to do with my children. The most important thing now for the, the state of the banking system is that those making decisions have a very good, very specific data and that they pay attention to them. They should not be vague survey data from the ABS and definitely not guesses based on what the banks and government would like to think was happening. Here are some questions they need to answer. How many of the people receiving the JobKeeper supplement have a mortgage and are using that money to make repayments? How many of them are on deferred repayments? How many of them will qualify for an extension? How many of the 829,640 businesses Receiving JobKeeper are also on loan repayment deferrals. These are some very good questions. The, these are some things. I, I don't know if we want to know the answer to these things because it's a, it's a little worrying. It's a little worrying. I mean, just think about that. If there's, there's going to be some businesses that will not survive this at all. If you're on JobKeeper, and even if you're getting JobKeeper and a loan deferral, and you can't even run your business, you're still incurring costs for your staff, for your super, and all the other costs that are associated with them. How many of them are in the, in the tourism, hospitality, or entertainment sectors and are therefore likely to see revenue stay down well beyond the end of JobKeeper? 
how many of the 4.7 million staff being paid the $1,500 per fortnight JobKeeper allowance are making mortgage repayments? How many are on zero hours? How many are on deferred repayments and how many of them will get an extension? How many businesses would have appointed voluntary administrators if the Corporations Act had not been amended in March to allow trading while insolvent for six months? This is the best. I'm glad he's bringing this to attention and talking about it. This is the one that's... It's just because of my experience as a small business owner and chasing bastards who owe me money. That's why. And, and as an architect, we're, it's hammered into us, particularly when we administer contracts between a builder and a client to make sure that, you know, do as much as we can to ensure the builder is not insolvent. And often that means engaging an accountant to do an audit or a check. The usual number is around eight to 700 insolvencies per month. A leading practitioner told me last week, work has fallen 70% because of that amendment. 70%, okay. So much worse than the 50% I thought. Which means that if these were normal times, about 600 firms a month would have been avoiding insolvency. But of course, these are not normal times. For a start, 728,640 have suffered a decline in revenue of 30% or more to qualify for JobKeeper. How many of those and their 4.7 million staff will be able to service their debts when the payment is cut to 1,200 next month? And how many when it goes to zero in March? And that's the question. This is why this is why we haven't seen the actual beginning of this recession yet, everyone. We haven't seen it. We haven't seen it. Until all of these things are removed, then we'll see the recession. Here's the question. Can the country heal? Can the economy heal and rebound and actually you know, grow legitimately as long as these interventions are in place? It's like the, the US, you know, where they you know, adjust rates, put rates up a bit, and boom, the market crashes. You know, are we stuck into a trap where we'll be perpetually propping up zombie businesses? Last week, the Reserve Bank of Australia published a research paper, uh, research discussion paper titled How Risky is Australian Household Debt? It concluded that the banking system is resilient and that the consequences of household indebtedness seem more likely to manifest through weaker economic growth than large bank losses. Good news, except the pandemic was barely mentioned. It's a good point. It was barely mentioned at all in that paper. And the paper was anything but an examination of the consequences for the banking system, exactly, of removing as planned income support, repayment deferrals, and the safe harbor from trading while insolvent. If the government, the RBA and APRA and the banks have not already got a joint team of data scientists locked in a room somewhere investigating that now before these things actually happen. The question is, what the hell are they doing? And Alan is the chief editor of the Eureka Report. So there we have it, everyone. Some very, very good questions that need to be asked and some answers that I think would be rather terrifying actually to hear. What do you think? This one here, you know, the trading while insolvent, that's the one that scares me the most. That's the one that scares me the most. Because I bet you there are businesses that are just kicking the can down the road, that are doing as much as they can to help out their staff. Okay, we can get JobKeeper. We'll keep you on for this. You know, and probably have told them, you're going to lose your job when JobKeeper disappears. Oh, I have to wind up. I bet you they are. What do you think, everyone? Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments. And do you think we'll start seeing the recession this year or will we really start seeing the, the impact of the recession when people start defaulting on their mortgages next year? As always, thanks for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel. If you're a fan and want to support the content I create here, there are a few ways you can. You can join the channel on YouTube or Patreon. You can support us using our affiliate links at Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve or KuCoin. You can buy a merch from Heiser Says, use Gold Pass from the Perth Mint or support us via PayPal. Take care. Have a great day. I will see you all in the next episode.